You're now listening to episode 123 of the Real Estate CPA Podcast. Your source for all things real estate, accounting, and tax. Here we reveal our secrets that can save you thousands in taxes, streamline your accounting process, and help grow your business. Stay tuned to hear insightful interviews with industry experts, successful real estate investors, and current clients on what strategies they use to grow their business and how they steer clear of Uncle Sam. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Brandon Hall and Thomas Costelli joined here today with Reed Goosens, real estate syndicator, investor, best-selling author, and public speaker. In today's episode, we discuss Reed's journey from Australian bloke to becoming a U.S. real estate investor, why foreign investors love United States real estate, tax tips for foreign investors investing in the U.S., why he chose to focus on the San Antonio, Texas market, and much more. Reed, thanks so much for taking time to come on the show today. Would you be able to give our listeners a little information on your background? Yeah, sure. Well, thank you so much for having me on, Thomas. Uh, Bit of a background. I guess every time I speak, you realize I'm not from this country. I'm from the the deep south uh, down near Australia. So I moved here in 2012 and I moved here as a structural engineer, uh, really just to be an expat in the United States. And I was chasing a girl at the time. That girl is now my wife. So happy, happy endings. And um, really, I'd already been bitten by the real estate bug prior to moving here in 2012. But when I came here, I realized just the incredible opportunities that maybe some Americans don't necessarily know that their fingertips and coming from a country where they, we don't have as much access to information on, on how to get started in real estate. I was really blown away with that access to information, but also, you know, just the barriers to entry here are a lot lower in secondary and tertiary markets compared to where I'm from. So, you know, that international superpower of knowing where you come from and sometimes some Americans don't really realize what they're sitting on or what they have, can they can take it for granted. And, and you know, hopefully today in this episode, I can show you that, you know, if an Aussie can move halfway across the world and, and make it happen, then so can the average American. Absolutely. I think you're 100% right. You know, I see this all the time with people who come here from other countries. Uh, They take advantage of the US system in a good way, you know, open up businesses and what have you. And what you see is a lot of people who just born and raised in America. The majority, I would say, overlook that and forget that that's possible. Um, So very interesting that you brought that up. And don't get me wrong, the same thing happens in Australia, right? Like you've got foreigners coming in, making it happen. It's just the expat way. And and it's it's more to do with probably mindset than anything else that, okay, you're here. There's only a one-way ticket back if it doesn't work out. You know what I mean? Like you have to make it work. So there's a little bit more backs against the wall. Um, and that, that applies to any, most most Western countries, I would imagine, with, with expats and immigrants and stuff like that. Absolutely. No, 100%. So I guess that, that kind of leads us into the next question, which is, you know, if you were to look back at your journey, what were like the most lasting or or most impactful actions you took when you first got here to the United States? Yeah, I think the most impactful was putting myself out there, you know, understanding where I've come from and the lack of, I mentioned earlier the, the lack of information. So when I say lack of information, I rocked up to New York City and there was this thing called a RIA, Real Estate Investment Association, these meetings that you pay 20 bucks at the door. I didn't have that in Australia. Like you've got so much incredible information and there's RIAs all over. Any MSA, I think most of them have a RIA. So these, you know, this tapestry of different networks that you can tap into at a very relatively low cost, coupled with the fact that I was in New York City, you know, very fast paced, you know, loud American lingo that I had to get caught up with, coupled with the fact that I saw these incredible investment opportunities that were only, you know, four hours, five hours outside of New York City in these second and tertiary markets were very cheap. And I remember buying my first property for $38,000. I could not buy a property in Australia for $38,000. It just doesn't exist. So just all these things that I, I, when I've come from, made me realize, well, okay, I need to sit up and pay attention here. Like there's a path here. I just need to follow it. And that's probably what we spoke about earlier, you know, some some Americans get just too caught up in their own what ifs and I can't do that and limiting beliefs. And it, it for me, it was like, well, I don't have this back in Australia. So this is pretty bloody good. Let's get going. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Yeah. I, I hear you hundred percent. You know, I, I'm from New York too. Everybody's big on real estate here in New York. And I know you mentioned that, you know, kind of the secondary and tertiary market. So you moved to New York city. Where did you buy your first property? Syracuse, New York, my friend. And the only reason I did Syracuse was because it was affordable. I had $30,000 in my bank account or like 30 or 40. I'd saved that up. The banks weren't lending to me. I knew I wanted to get started. I knew I did, you know, at the time of moving to uh, New York City, 
Thomas, I, I'd already been educating for about two and a half years up until that point in Australia, self-educating that is, in the real estate world. And I just need to get going. Like I had this money and I was like, I could keep spending it on gurus and seminars and, or I could go out and just make it happen. Because remember, you don't lose weight or you know get fit by reading about it. You have to go out and take action sometimes and get on that treadmill. So for me, it was, I don't get to deal number 10 without doing deal number one. And the only thing I liked about Syracuse was that it was somewhat of a steady city. It was affordable. I could afford it. It was also only a four-hour bus ride. I used to get on the Greyhound bus every Saturday morning or a couple of times a month. And it was a four-hour drive up. You'd get there for a couple of hours. The broker would pick me up from the bus station, would tour some little properties. I'd get back on the bus at two o'clock, be back in New York City by six o'clock to have a few beers with the boys. And it was just I had to do that stuff to get uncomfortable and figure out you know, where I wanted to get started. And, and that first deal was the most important deal for me because it proved to me that I could do this and it proved to me that you don't get off home base without just taking that first step and taking some action. So, yeah. You, sometimes you just got to get started, right? And, you know, my personal philosophy on it, on like education, everything like that, it's like there's a certain amount of initial <laughs> education that you that you want right. to get. Uh, but at some point, you just got to, you know, start, you know, you, you got to pick up the bat and start swinging. Otherwise, exactly. you know, you're not, you're not going to get anywhere. So, you know, from there, how, how did your journey evolve from that, that I know I met you at Jake and Gino's event, I think in the past and, yep. um, you're in the syndication business. How did you go from, you know, your first property in Syracuse? Uh, how did you get to real estate syndication? Would you be able to take us through that journey? Yeah, for sure. So the first deal in Syracuse led to the second deal in Syracuse. That second deal led to a deal in Philadelphia, which I flipped. Still working full time in New York City. At that time, I'm, a friend of mine came down from Vancouver, uh, who I happened to study with in Australia. It's, you know, we went to school together. And he, you know, I was boasting about these three little properties I had and, you know, oh, this cash flow, blah, blah, blah. And he, I didn't even know that he was investing in real estate as well, also being a civil engineer. And he told me about how he closed on a 70 unit deal. And I said, you mean seven zero, like 70 units in one deal? And he said, yeah. And I said, how the hell did you do that? And he said, yeah, and this was in British Columbia in Canada. And um, he told me about other people's money. He told me about getting a mentor. He talked to me about seller care back financing, all these things that I knew about or had learned, were learning about, but he had put it into action. And so for me, moving halfway across the world, that was the most scariest thing in the world. You know, getting a job here. I didn't have a job when I first moved here, moving in with this girl that I just started dating, all these big firsts. And so to go buy my first deal and then buy a second deal and buy a third deal, they're like the smaller steps. And then when I saw him doing these big things, I was like, oh, I need to up my game, right? I also knew at that point in time, I was coming to the end of my rope in terms of coaching. You know, I, I needed a coach. I needed someone in my in my corner. And that's when I went and got a mentor. And I ended, ended up liquidating those two first properties in Syracuse um, to sort of help fund the, the growth of the business and, and start focusing more on building my brand and building my investor database. And that's what I really focused on. Um, and then through that, I ended up partnering with my mentor on a couple of deals. And over a period of three or four years, I was then able to break out on my own and start Wildhorn Capital with my business partner, Andrew Campbell. And today we own uh, 2,200 units in Central Texas and uh, we have about a quarter billion dollars assets under management. And I, I don't say those large numbers and, and they're relatively small compared to other operators. I know that, but it's more the fact that I say it to inspire because again, goes back to my story of like, I came here eight years ago. If I can do it with visa issues, I had marriage issues, I had, you know, green card issues, I had, uh, you know, I didn't know anyone when I first moved here, I had limited funds. Like if, if I can do it, then then so can the average American. And that's what I hopefully people get out of this episode today is a bit of inspiration. Absolutely. And I, I have a few questions about your operations, how you go about building a team and what have you. But before I get to there, there's a lot of different you know, syndicators out there. They're doing uh, some, some of them are doing multifamily. Some of them are doing self-storage, mobile, home parks. Yep, yeah, self mobile home parks. Why multifamily? Yeah, look, why multifamily? So in Australia, we actually don't have large scale garden style apartments like you do here in, in America. I, I, I would be very pressed if you ask me what other Western country in the world had the same sort of setup as that sort of garden style. And the reason is because of our financing vehicles in Australia, we only have 24 million people, 25 million people. The same land mass as mainland America, but we can only inhabit the coasts because the middle is, is a desert. And so when you only have a limited population, they're all surrounded the major cities, you then have limited financing vehicles. And so we have a very much, a, we don't have the Freddie and Fannie model where you can get 
commercial grade loans for three and four percent interest only for ten years. Oh, you know, we don't have that. We also don't have the the. And I want to say the word sophistication isn't the correct word. It's just the more the lack of financing options in Australia where. We do a build to sell model. So we do condos, right? We do, or it's all about uh, negatively geared. So we don't, you'd be very hard pressed to find a quote unquote cash flowing assets in the residential space, meaning apartments or uh, single family. And so when, you know, the whole multifamily coming to America and seeing the financing options, seeing the fact that there's non-recourse debt, seeing the fact that you, you know, we, we don't, we just didn't come from that type of way of thinking. Like I would never have been able to go out and buy my first 192 units in Australia. Like it just wouldn't have happened. So all those things is really why I gravitated towards multifamily. Um, as we grow, I'm sure we're going to do other asset classes, but you know, we wanted to really, we're only at 2,200 units right now. We've been going for about four or five years. So we want to get in probably to 3,000 units and then maybe diversify outside of that. But um, hopefully that answered your question. No, I know it, it certainly did. One uh, one follow-up question to what you said before, you know, you, you have a partner that you work with. Are you a vertically integrated shop? Like, do you have, I guess, what role do you play? Are you are mm-hmm. you on the capital raising side? Are you on the operations side? It was, are, you, um, are you vertically integrated or are you using third-party property management? Yeah, at this stage, we're still using third-party. Uh, and the reason is we're, we're still a relatively small shop. Uh, we've got an executive assistant. There's myself, there's Andrew Campbell, in my business partner. I'm really on the operations side. I do all the asset management, construction management. I raise, obviously, capital as well. Um, but Andrew focuses more on the deal finding. So he, given my engineering, background and this is some advice for anyone out there looking for a partner you know we had very complementary skill sets he he wasn't a detailed orientated type of guy where i am like i come from the institutional ground up construction world so i knew how to build stuff i knew how to manage stuff in a way that maybe the average person didn't so we have a very complementary skill set he's based locally i needed a local person to help me win deals and that's what he focuses on he's very good at is you know shaking the lemon tree and i determine if we make lemonade or lemon juice out of that uh, out of that fruit so that's really the the yin and the yang as we grow you know, we want to become vertically integrated at some point but we also know that you need to get a certain mass of units to make that flick of the switch more profitable straight away rather than being a loss leader so yeah Absolutely. So what markets are you currently in? Uh, you know, you start in Syracuse, you did syndication now. What markets are you currently looking at? Yeah, Syracuse was just obviously to get started. I don't, I'm no longer, I haven't been invested in there since 2013. I'm primarily in Austin and San Antonio. Started in San Antonio, we've now gravitated up towards Austin. Um, seeing the, the boom in which Austin is experiencing is through the last two decades or two and a half decades of institutional spending from the municipality in attracting businesses to Austin, the global stance of which it has now, um, the really, you can see it changing into a coastal market, um, direct flights in and out of London twice a week. It's on the map. It's a big tech scene. So understanding where I've come from, I, I was lived in New York and I now live in LA and also coming from Australia where the supply and demand curve it really means that, you know, you think of LA, you think of New York, you think of San Francisco, it's a high demand, low supply drives low cap rates. That's what Australia is. That's what Europe is in London, uh, in, in Tokyo, in, in Hong Kong. And seeing a town like Austin graduate into that sort of tier one city where they have the high demand issues, but the low supply, seeing that prices of dirt in downtown Austin trade for just as much as the price of dirt in downtown Los Angeles for high rise construction you can see something coming. And so if we can buy existing assets, yes, you will pay more than what you'd pay in other secondary or tertiary markets. But the fact is you have a low risk factor there because there's so much demand to want to move there and live there. And that's what we are. You know, we know in the next 10 years, Austin's going to double in size in population. So we're on the right end of the curve to be riding that wave as this goes goes on into the future. So, so all that sounds great, but how do you how do you figure that out? Like, what 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 are you analyzing, and what sure. what sources of data are you looking at to to understand? Oh, Austin, San Antonio over Houston, or Charlotte, North Carolina, or Georgia, or Atlanta, Georgia. Like, how do you kind of systematically look at this stuff? Yeah, I think the big thing is looking at. Um, so, so firstly, you know, we'll, we'll just separate San Antonio and Austin, right? Like, I started in San Antonio; it's a lot more affordable. It's a lot more slow and steady wins the race. It's a bigger municipality but doesn't have the X factor that Austin does. Now, why is that? Okay, well, the reason is the attraction of wanting to live in the place. You know, it's cultural scene. It's investment from the local municipality, as I said before, into infrastructure. And when you look at 
the municipality of Austin versus the municipality of, say, San Antonio, they're heavily investing. And the reason Austin is what it is today is through decisions made in the mid-90s about raising bonds to invest in infrastructure in and around Austin to attract businesses to the Austin market in and around the UT medical system, in and around tech, in and around diversification out of being a boom and bust type of town into more of a stable global town. And, and again, that can only happen from the top. That can only happen from people in power. That can only happen from community input. So all that type of stuff I look at because that is what people want to live around. That's what people want to build as community around. That's what people want to invest in for the long term. And so they're all the things that I, you know, specific data. I, I have friends at the local Austin municipality who sit on the board of economics, uh, economic development. So I, I know what's coming to town. I, I have a little bit of an inside track. I don't know people on the board in San Antonio, but I definitely do know that, you know, Tesla isn't moving to San Antonio, they're moving to Austin. You know what I mean? They're moving to Austin for a reason. So there's just different things that are happening in the local market from through job supply. And if you follow the jobs, you will have growth in, in my Interesting. opinion. Interesting. So it sounds like it's it's a lot of objective data, but there's also there's also a lot of subjectivity that needs to you get you have to apply your personal experience, your understanding of the market. Correct. Uh, very interesting. Okay. Correct. I was just talking to a developer in Raleigh, North Carolina, yesterday, mm-hmm. that was kind of saying the same thing. He was like, "Yeah, if I go out of my area and I want to invest in like Virginia." then it's all going to be based on objective data. But then you're competing with everybody else that's analyzing that objective data. Whereas instead, if you invest in your local market that you know really well, because I asked him, I was like, how do you know How do you know what plot that you're buying and developing on is going to work out? And you're just like, you just, it's just a feel thing almost, which is bizarre. <laughs> you know, you're playing well, with tens of millions of dollars. <laughs> well, you know, like I live in Los Angeles and I worked for a big developer here for many, many years before going starting my own company. You've never heard of him, but he's he owns half of Beverly Hills and and half of Long Beach, right? Now, you know, these are very compressed markets, but you can still make money in your backyard. You just got to know how to go squeeze that lemon again to make sure you're getting the juice out of it because everything does have a higher and best use. Everything in terms of the municipality, in terms of governors and council members want to see their communities grow. And that's where the intersection of private and public come together and they use develop private developers to extend their vision of what they want to see for the local municipality. I don't care where you choose, Raleigh, North Carolina, Long Beach, California, Austin, Texas, there's always a need and want to build community and to keep talent and to keep essentially taxpayers in their area so they can keep the city going. And and so when you have that harmonious relationship between the, the developers and the policymakers, and you're keyed into what they're thinking, then, but to your friend who, who's developing in, in Raleigh, North Carolina, he probably knows a lot of people on the on the economic development board for Raleigh that they know where things are going to, where the path of progress is going. Like he wouldn't be stupid to just buy anything, right? He knows where things are coming. He can see it. He lives it. He breathes it. He can, oh, 20 years ago, that that, that wasn't there, you know, or that, 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 infra, that light rail system wasn't there, or they're, you know, they're, they're building a, a new airport or you know, all these things in terms of the, the growth of a city, you, you need to have your finger on the pulse um, no matter where you are. And that, that, go, that, that applies across the world. That doesn't just apply here in America. I love it. I love it. All right. So transitioning a little bit, let's talk about some foreign investors because you, you, you have a pretty good tranche of foreign investors investing into your your syndicates, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, uh, surprisingly more Americans than foreign, but yeah, started out with a lot of foreigners and, and they take about 25% of our, our investor base right now. Um, but that's kind of do with a little bit of the foreign exchange risk, but we won't get into that. Yeah. But you, we, you, we can talk a little bit about how they do it. I think you, you get it. I'm going to preemptively answer yeah. the question. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's what I would like to dive into. We haven't really talked about foreign investment a mm-hmm. lot mm-hmm. on this podcast. Maybe just kind of talk to us a little bit about why somebody would invest in the US if they live out of the, out yep. of state or out of the country. Yep. And what sort of things do they need to be aware of, like reporting wise or, mm-hmm. or tax wise? Well, what's your experience mm-hmm. with that? So let's start with the first one, right? Um, high level wise, I mentioned this earlier, the United States, and I think I just came out of a meeting uh, with another gentleman who's, who's a foreigner who, who invests heavily here in America. The United States from a commercial real estate point of view is in my opinion, has creates the most yield. And that is to do with what I was mentioning earlier, the attractive debt options that you have, low interest rate debt on commercial assets, the non-recourse nature in which America's lending system is based on, and the fact that of the population and that this huge GDP that you know it is the biggest GDP in the world, uh, right? So you have good good yield, and you have these markets which are your ter- your primary markets. You have your secondary markets. You have your tertiary markets. You have this really 
nearly like Europe in one country, if that makes sense. And so there's a lot of attraction for that when, when people are buying in London an office tower at two caps, uh, 2% cap rate. They can come to New York City and buy uh, an office tower for 4% cap rate. Well, they just got that at, at, at a half a discount compared to where they're from. So that to them is, is enticing. The yield is obviously very important. Uh, there's also some some privacy issues in and around investing here in the United States as a foreigner that, that are very attractive to foreign investors. But but overall, to the second part of the question, how do you invest here? Well, the big thing is if you're going to invest in here, and this also goes to operators who want to attract international capital, if you are an operator here in the United States and you have international people coming to you, they can't just give you money, right? They can't just say, here's, here's my $100,000, go make some money out of it because you're then liable to withhold 30% of any of the earnings that they have on that tax. And you don't want that. You want to be at arm's length. And so for all my foreign investors, I make them set up a US entity here in the United States. It's their own entity. They manage it. They own it. They can do whatever they want with it. They start bank accounts here. They also need to start an EIN number, which is sorry, an ITIN number, um, uh, an individual tax identification number. It's, it's the same thing as a social security number for foreign investors or for foreign people. And then once you fund your bank account, once you fund your LLC, you can then go off and buy um, you know, assets, whether it be your own individual assets as a single family or small multifamily, or you invest in syndications. And then from that, that US entity will then still have to report to the United States IRS. That's the reason as an operator, you want to be at arm's length uh, because you don't want to have that liability. And they will just be like any other entity that invests into your deal. You will give them a K-1, they will go report it to the IRS. The thing that's going to be different, obviously, is because of international folks is how does it affect their home country, right? And the simple answer is, I don't know, right? I'm not an expert on everyone. It's a good answer. <laughs> else's individual countries. <laughs> but but what they have to understand is that you're going to have a CPA here in the United States, which we can hook you up with a good CPA that can help you with your US entity tax liability. Uh, and then you're going to have to have your home-based entity, wherever that is, right? And so whatever, if you're part of the US treaty, if you're not part of the US tax international, US, US international tax treaty, if you're part of that or not, that will obviously affect your home tax obligations. But again, you have a CPA in your home country that will help you advise you on whatever dividend you get out of the United States uh, entity to your homeland. So there's also then, you know, other countries who have risk of government powers taking their money, you know, third world and developing countries that want to get money out of the country into US dollars. And the fact that, as mentioned, that your money is backed by the greenback, um, which is the currency for the International Monetary Fund and the International Bank. So all those things are why people want to invest in America. And we've just covered a, a, a ton of data. So I'm sure I'm just going to stop and let you guys ask some questions. <laughs> <laughs> and that was really good. So sometimes people ask me, like foreign investors will ask me, how do I set up a US bank account? And I honestly never have a good answer, except yeah. go check out this law firm that I work with that can probably help you with that. Do you have like yeah, resources or an answer to that? Look, it has, I will admit it has gotten harder. It, it definitely, back in the day when I first moved here, you could start bank accounts online. There is no, I have not found a decent solution because of fraud. And I understand why the US government does this, that it really like all my international investors who are from Australia or from England, I really sort of tell them like, look, if you guys are going to invest here for the long term, I want you coming out here looking at the deals, right? Don't invest in something that if you haven't seen it or you haven't seen the market. So when you come out, you're going to be here in person, then we'll get you open a bank account because you're in person and banks want to see a, a, a passport or something. And that's when you can open the bank account. That's been the only real way of doing it. It kills two birds with one stone, you know, due diligence for the investor point of view, um, but also they get to come out and be physically here in the country and they can go up, open that bank account. Unless you have another way that I don't know about, that's, you know, there, there are other, I will lie, there are other slightly different ways. If you're a high net worth individual in your home country, I know HSBC, big international banks, Goldman Sachs of the world, they will allow you to open up US bank accounts because you are a high net worth individual. Now, not everyone falls into that category. So you get treated a little differently. Um, yeah, that, that's interesting. I, I like that idea of physically coming out and just getting it all set up in one go. I guess it makes it a little harder in, in COVID though. <laughs> It does, it, 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 but it will pass. And, and you know, there's also the powers of attorney. There's different other little ways of getting it done, but that's a little bit more, you know, my mind sketchy. I, I think that the, 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 the when you're investing internationally, get boots on the ground. I'm, just come and see the goddamn thing. You can write off as a tax a tax write-off coming and, and go to Disneyland or something or go to New York City, go to, do something with the family as you come out here. 
Do you see a lot of, uh, and I know this isn't necessarily your, your area of speciality, but do you see a lot of investors, you know, on the, in the, on the foreign side, do they prefer to invest like a passively, like invest in a syndicate or do they want to actually buy the physical real depends. estate? It depends. Like the smaller guys, you know, the 50,000, hundred thousand dollar check writers, they'll just, they've got to invest passively, right? They can't, they're not going to out hustle me in Austin, Texas, right? They're not going to out hustle you guys in Raleigh, North Carolina, um, because of the local stuff. So they they know to partner with good operators, right? I when I first moved out here, when the Australian dollar and you know the euro was more in in favour, um, when the US was struggling a little bit, in 2012, 2013, there's a lot of those turnkey investments that people are getting into for, as international investors, but were getting burnt because they either didn't one come and see the deal or two that was buying just crappy deals. And so it goes back to when you invest with a syndicator, you're probably more, it's more of an alignment that the syndicator's business is making sure he makes you money or she makes you money. And so they want to make sure they're investing in the right deal. Plus they've got the local knowledge. Plus you, you know, you're not going to be able to out hustle them from afar. So the majority of the investors, obviously we deal with are, are passive investors and they like that. Makes a lot of sense. So, you know, at, at this point, do you have any plans to expand outside of just multifamily investing or why or why not? So the short answer is yes, 100%. We want to be an inch wide and a mile deep in our chosen markets. I think the only time we will go and diversify into another market is if our larger LP investors force us to go do that. But for right now, we're 2,200 units. We're still relatively new. You know, We don't have the urge or the need. We could go buy another 2,000 units in Austin and San Antonio in the next three to five years and be just fine. You know, We don't need to go and try and... We, we, we looked at Atlanta, you know, we looked at other markets, Denver, and we're just another person in the line, right? We didn't have any sort of special source. You know, And that's really what makes us effective in the Austin market is because of, of Andrew, because he's born and bred there. He hangs around the hoop. He knows all the brokers. You know, So having that relationship means that you're going to get first bite of the apple if things come come off market. And we've out of our nine deals that we've bought so far, I think three of them have come off market to us before, you know, preemptively come, before they uh, hit the market. So there, there is a value in being local and understanding the people who who run the city and and what, what brokers you need to go uh, have golf with or, or, or have a beer with uh, in order to get those uh, those pocket listings. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. You know, there's I mean, because there's so many different syndicators out there, and like I am a strong believer in kind of what you're saying. You know, an inch deep, but a mile, uh, an inch wide, but a mile deep um, in certain markets because you can get that, like you were talking about before, that really expertise of what's going on in that specific market. Build those relationships and really just focus on that. What's your opinion on the syndicators that are going everywhere? Do they, you know, what what are the weaknesses? So the there? weaknesses I think you're going to have is is a lot of obviously just a lot of travel right and when it's in COVID, it's hard to to really i think it's a lot of people realized having two deals here in florida and two deals in texas and three deals in denver like it just bringing it together means that you can fly into that one area and do a lot more with your time so it's more effective in time but also you have the shared resources right if you have a thousand units in one msa your cost basis is going to be a lot more effective than if you have 200 units in one MSA and then another 200 units in another MSA. It just means that you can be more condensed and allows for that vertical integration, which you asked earlier, to happen a lot sooner. So from my point of view, I, I know personally investors and, and quite very successful investors out of New York and Long Island who have been all over the place. And as COVID has come around, they've been more saying, okay, screw that. I'm not going to go do the, the 200 units in Mobile, Alabama. I need to focus in Jacksonville, you know, Florida. And it's been really, you know, inch wide and a mile deep there and build out that thousand plus units in an MSA before you may move on to another MSA. And I think that's a good number. You're having a thousand units in an MSA. You've probably built four, five, six deals in that area. That's enough to, you know, share resources, understand good market data in terms of spend and costs and all that sort of stuff. So then before you can sort of graduate on into the next MSA, that, that's my rule of thumb, at least. A hundred percent. I mean, I, I agree with that. I was once an aspiring syndicator and uh, my thought process was always like pretty much everything you said, focus on that one market, really get to know that one market, build up a certain amount of units. So you have that economies of scale and then you could eventually vertically Absolutely. integrate. And then at some point later on in the future, you know, maybe, maybe not, maybe you go and explore into another market and you do the same thing, but you really... Because to me, like if you're going to invest in multiple markets, you know, as a passive investor, putting your money in multiple markets um, with other syndicators, yes. that makes sense. And that that's a different story. But like as the operator, as the syndicator yourself, like you're spreading yourself really thin when you're going over all these different markets and you're really never digging deep into any one market to really gain that 
the ground that you need. Um, and, so. and I'll add to that, it's like you also have a very attractive product at the end, right, that you built. Selling 200 units in one market, yeah, that's great. Selling 1,000 units in one market, you're going to get a different institutional type of buyer who wants to go and buy 1,000 units in one MSA. They instantly have scale, right? They're, they're buyers out there who are above our pay grade, you know, above our sort of level, the Wall Street types, the institutions. They're like, yeah, I'll come buy 1,000 units tomorrow, you know. Sure. <laughs> so they yeah. can be, they can instantly play in a flag rather than sort of what we're building is slowly building one deal at a time. So it does have a lot of benefits on the exit as well. No, for sure. You know, I, I've read a lot and, and kind of explored a lot into business. And what you see also on the business side of it too, it's like if you're buying businesses, you can actually combine a lot of different businesses together. And when you combine mm -hmm. them, you actually sell for a higher multiple Correct. because there's a lot of value in that combination already being there. Like va va of, value and, and reduced risk because you can spread the risk out over multiple either businesses or deals. 100%. Is there anything else you think that our listeners should know about, you know, investing foreignly or it, did we about cover it before? Look, I think overall is, you know, they're doing the right thing, you know, listening to podcasts like this, this great podcast and just keep, keep going at it. You know, like it's, I, I I'm still going, I'm still aspiring to do more and be more. Uh, hopefully my story can inspire the average person to, to get out there and take a little bit of action, if anything. And, and really it's, it's all about learning to bet on oneself because at the end of the day, you're the best person to bet on, right? And, and if you can't take a bet on yourself, then who can you take a bet on? Absolutely. The people that you invest with. <laughs> right. I'm, to, I'm to, you know, you know what I mean. Like you, you take, I got you, I got you, you, you. You know what I mean. Like you're, you're not going to sit on the sit on your hands and be like, oh, something's going to happen. Like no, it's not, nothing's going to happen. If you don't get out and do something. So. Yeah, you know, even as a passive investor, you gotta take action. You gotta take Correct, action to make that investment overcome your fear. You know, if, and sometimes you gotta take that leap. So, if our listeners want to learn more about you, what you have going on, what would be the best way for them to do so? Easiest way is to jump over to readgoosens.com. That's R-E-E-D-G-O-O-S-S-E-N-S.com. I've got a podcast, got a couple of books out. You can check all those stuff out on the website. And then for those people who are getting back on planes or when you do get back on a plane, you come back and you're coming through LA at all and you want to meet up for a beer or coffee and talk some shop, um, you can hit me up at info at readgoosens.com. Just give me a, a month or so heads up before we, uh, before we come so we can get on the calendar. Absolutely. I want to thank you for coming on the show today. I learned a lot about the international side of things. And um, thanks again for coming on. Thanks, boys. Thanks for listening to today's show. If you enjoyed the show, please find us on iTunes and leave us a review. You can also email us at contact at therealestatecpa.com with any feedback or topic suggestions. We are always taking on new clients. And with the new tax laws in play, you really don't want to navigate this alone. Let us help you save money on taxes and with your accounting and CFO needs. To become a client, navigate to our client page at therealestatecpa.com and fill out a web form with as much detail about your situation as possible. Thanks so much for listening. Have a great rest of your week.